Hey everyone, welcome to another Ask Gene episode. I think this is our last one we're shooting here. We're in Tokyo right now. We were in Taiwan previously, and we have a rapid fire Computex Ask Gen that'll go up shortly. We also have a Patreon backer Ask Gen, as always, on patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you want access to that content. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the Gamers Nexus Anti Static Mod Map. The GN Anti Static Mod Map is a four foot by two foot surface, two millimeters thick of high quality industrial grade anti static material and it includes a common ground point for earth, a grounding wrist strap, and it has on it electrical wiring diagrams that may prove useful, a GPU silhouette and grid for your teardown efforts, and other useful items. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a GN mod mat today. So for this week, we have a couple good questions. One of them, the first one, I'm gonna have to read some answers from Buildzoid for because I wanted to make sure I really got a good answer on it. Referenced him and it's from a Brigadier Ketchup is his name, who asks, some power supply manufacturers, including EVGA, have in their product descriptions and advertising for helping you achieve higher overclocks. Would you say that this is fundamentally true? So I did, I spoke with Buildzoid about this. I think to an extent, it can be true for sure. It, it depends on kind of what you're talking about for overclocking though. Uh, certainly a really cheap bad power supply is going to impact just about everything, but once you get into decent and above, how much does it really matter? So uh, OCP limits are something to pay attention to at the very top level. If you have, for example, multi-rail without a single rail toggle or function, that can be a limiter. Where We've run into that in the past with some of our power supplies where they're multi-rail and they don't allow single rail toggling and you can't change OCP. So with something like a 7980XE, it's not hard to trip OCP at like 50 amps or something like that. So that can be a limit. But to get to the more serious part of the answer, uh, it kind of comes down to potentially impacting how much voltage you have to apply to the core or whatever you're overclocking in order to maintain a stable overclock, which can impact thermals and current and stuff like that. So for Buildzoid's answer, what he said was, power supply output ripple is relative to power supply output power. If you have a power supply that has terrible ripple at full power and your OC pulls the power supply rated max output, you're gonna have worse voltage regulation on the output of the VRM. You know, it's also NVIDIA cards have current based power limits. So if you run Pascal on a power supply that slides from 12.3 to 11.6 volts, you will boost slightly lower than on a 12 volt flat power supply or a 12.3 to 12 volt power supply. And uh, power being a, he said it's a function, this overclocking for Pascal specifically is a function that's slightly limited by current, uh, depending on what you're working with. So and with wattage being, by the way, a, a, a multiplication, a product of current and voltage. So Buildzoid continues and says, if a power supply has bad transient response, it will make the output of the VRM worse and notes that with 7980XEs on liquid nitrogen, the main concern is having the power supply not trip OCP. When you go from idle to full load, the VRM needs to quickly pull itself from pushing, say, 2.3 volts, 40 amps, to 2.3 volts, 400 amps, and that causes a massive current spike. It further continues, the VRM may well just turn on all of the high side FETs at the same time to try and maintain the output voltage because VRM output voltage is tied to current flow through the inductors and at idle, the inductors have very little current flowing through them. They will drop voltage in order to maintain the same level of current flow. Again, they're a function of the two when, when you're talking about power. And in order to increase the current flow through the inductors, you need to apply 12 volt on the phase side of them. Uh, and then if during one PWM cycle you have 30 millivolts or more, then on the next at random for Ripple, the, it just makes the output of the VRM that much noisier. So uh, that's most of the stuff to consider. That's from Buildzoid. If you don't know who he is, go to Actually Hardcore Overclocking on YouTube. That's his channel. He does work for us as well here on Gamers Nexus. Next one, Jeff M says, are you looking at getting any Fantex cases for testing this year? In my opinion, the Evolve X seems to be a solid contender for the best high-end case this year, and I'd love to see it put through its paces with your thermal testing. Answered this in the Rapid Fire Computex video where we talked about uh, Fantex in three questions. And to just recap it again, Fantex was unable to accommodate a meeting after multiple attempts at Computex, so we will instead be purchasing the case as soon as it's available to give it a, a look through our testing as usual, because I didn't get to see it in person. So we'll look at it. That's fine. Not everyone can accommodate a meeting at trade shows. They're, they're very busy with a lot of people, and they have to meet more than just media. They're meeting uh, all of their channel partners and stuff like that as well. So no big deal, I suppose, though it is we got turned away several times. So whatever, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll buy one. Next question is from uh, Talbs Recreational Nukes, who has the best name, it says, why and how are some RAM kits opt optimized for Intel and some for AMD? 
how would this binning process work? It's actually not a binning process so much as it is uh, the motherboard support. So with X470, a lot of the updates were just improvements to memory profiles over X370 with chipset updates being functionally zero. And it comes down not to binning of the memory dies or the quality of the ICs, but rather to the, uh, the validation of those chips, those dies on the different AMD boards. And it just so happens that Samsung B-Die works very well with AMD uh, in an easier fashion. You can get the other stuff to still work. It's just B-Die is more or less plug and play as long as it's been validated on the board. So it comes down to uh, memory is very manual. The vendors have to test it. And that's why we recommend, especially with Ryzen, when you buy a motherboard, go to the supported memory kit and make sure, or the list rather, and make sure that the kit you want is on that list, that they validated it. It actually matters. It's not just plug and play. Sure, that'll work, but if you really want performance, that's what you have to do, because there is testing involved, and they basically the vendors go through and they manually tune all of those sub-timings that they can anyway, so when you plug the kit in, it's not just picking timings at random, which is what will happen if they're not manually tuned on the board. It'll just, it'll keep retrying, failing to boot, retry, and that's called memory training. So the fewer uh, timings that are need, in need of manual tuning by you, the better. And that's going to come down to the motherboard vendors more than the memory kit makers, although the memory kit makers work with the vendors to make sure that it's all uh, on the up and up. Next one is from GGCHB who says, Steve, would overclocking be easy in space if the PCB were outside the ship where space is, negative 273 Celsius, or would lack of air prevent conduction of thermal energy away from the core? So this is a really interesting question. Uh, I, I saw some comments talking about how cold space is or isn't and whether or not it would actually be negative 273. I don't know what, what temperature different parts of space are, but let's just kind of assume that you are actually at basically absolute zero or very, very cold temperatures like you're suggesting. A couple of problems here. One of them is cold bugs. So uh, actually being too cold can be a problem. And with the scenario you're talking about, because there's no air, there's no air flow, uh, there is going to be a problem where dissipation is not really possible. You're actually going to do better with radiation and heat than with normal conduction and dissipation because that's that's the most you can do at a temperature like say I don't know three Kelvin or something like that or five Kelvin whatever it's basically sub 10k uh, radiation is what you're dealing with for, for the most part rather than airflow because there is none. So uh, that's going to limit things but before that's a problem because that would be a heat problem not a cold problem because you can't get rid of the heat fast enough before getting rid of heat is a problem you have to turn the system on and cold bugs are for, let's take Titan V for example. The Titan V has a lot of trouble below 10 degrees, negative 10, that is uh, Celsius for doing much of anything. HBM2 has a whole lot of problems with negative temperatures Celsius uh, where it, it can just become unstable, has cold bugs, doesn't boot. We saw this with Caden Penn's RoboClocker where if Tin, his, uh, his man on the keyboard basically setting the target temperature, if he set the temperature too low before the system turned on, it would just not boot. And that's a problem, that's a cold bug. So that's why they have things like socket heaters on the back as well. Sometimes the heaters are to prevent things like um, condensation, but other times it's actually to prevent a cold bug where the silicon just bugs out, just stops working below a certain temperature. And so that's, uh, that's probably a bigger problem. You won't be able to even turn the system on. But if you can, then getting rid of the heat is going to be a big challenge as well because there's no uh, dis dissipation via airflow and conduction. It's, you're going to be relying on radiation. Uh, next question is from actually the same person, I think. GGCHB says, is there a good alternative to liquid metal for delitting long term? Most people recommend replacing LM every nine months. I'm too lazy. Is there a high quality Tim? So, Speaking from personal experience now, we've had a, a high-end CPU running liquid metal for several, actually a, a year at this point, or slightly more than a year, and haven't had to replace it. Thermal performance is more or less the same as it has always been, and that's Conductonaut. So speaking with Thermal Grizzly, they are a biased source, keep that in mind. They have tested up to two years, as far as I'm aware, and say that two years is fine for Conductonaut. So I haven't tested beyond the year or so that we've done the, the system we're running for this long-term endurance test, but it's still doing just fine. So I don't think, I think with the quality liquid metal, you don't have to replace it quite as much. As for Tim's, 
Yeah, just uh, you want something that is not going to cure in the same way that stuff like the, the stock ace, that compound, it's pretty good, but it cures and becomes hardened after a while, and that's a bad thing to put under the dye. So it's something like uh, Cryonaut where it doesn't cure, and there are other ones, uh, Gelid Extreme, stuff like that would be fine too. Just if it's conductive, be very careful and make sure you mask any SMDs so you don't short them. But um, anything that doesn't cure quickly or at all would be ideal. And actually Intel stock paste, if you want lazy, is a good route too. It's just not particularly conductive, but it does last a long time. So uh, that's the easiest thing to do, of course. If you want to deal it though, get something that doesn't cure too much and has a high thermal conductivity. Next one is from Wormwood who says, uh, this is a quick one. Any idea when an 8086K review will hit? The answer is probably never because it's an 8700K that's been overclocked and it's priced too high and it's kind of a dumb thing to buy. So next, uh, next question from Silk Monkey who says, with the trade shows, Combi Dex E3, et cetera, going on, I was wondering what was the best gimmick you saw at a booth at a show, and what was the weirdest? The best, I'll say gimmick, was probably Der Bauer's cooler, and I, the only reason I'd even apply the word gimmick to it is it's a functional thing. It does cool the product. It's, it's his face change cooler, so it's not 3M Novik, but it's another fluid. So it does actually cool the product. It's fun, functional, but it's not going to be a standard solution you would put into your system. You typically go with a CLC or an air cooler. So we really like what he's done with the phase shift cooler. It's just that it's something that gets a lot of attention and it'll be low product volume. Very interesting product. Might be good, we haven't tested it, but at the end of the day, it's something that he's done to get some, uh, some marketing buzz as like a Halo product. And we look forward to it, we gave an award, all that stuff. But yes, I would ultimately say that it is somewhat of a gimmick because is it necessary? No, of course not. You could use propylene glycol and distilled water, but uh, it's cool to see something different nonetheless. The weirdest was probably Asus a separate, separating MITX case because it was a very odd implementation. It separates to allow airflow, but there's no ventilation on either side of the separating joints. So it actually doesn't allow airflow. But that's their plan, I guess, after some revisions. Last two, Inks says, where did you or uh, do you learn about the business side of what you do here on the channel? Marketing, how to sell ads, best way to approach companies and so on. Behind the scenes of running the channel. The answer is doing it for like 10 years, basically, uh, on the website side, doing YouTube a bit later. And kind of trying things until they worked is, is really the answer. That's the only way to do it, I think and being in front of people at trade shows as much as possible. Next question, El Pai says, how do you feel after heat torturing the poor mod mat? Uh, so it was, I mean, it was pretty cool. It was cool to see how well it held up to things like soldering and uh, the heat gun for tube bending, stuff like that. It holds, holds up super well, because it's not a soldering mat. And as long as you're okay with a, a singe mark, it, it was really quite good with soldering. So a uh, silicone mat would be the best if you want something that's like really, really resistant to soldering irons at a high temperature. But we were very happy with the results of our mat, mat even though it's not marketed as a soldering mat. And it did very well with tube bending temperatures as well. So uh, as far as how I feel about it, I'd say it was justified and we can still use it in our lab, even though it's, it's a bit scarred at this point. So as always, if you're interested in one of those, go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat. They are on the way now, so you can back order it, make sure you get one. Otherwise, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to, pick up, to watch our bonus episode. Subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.